overall a very productive week at moving forward some of the caucus's priorities. We started the session uh, talking about uh, litigation reform and uh, regulatory reform, and we've got two major uh, pieces of that this week. So uh, the three issues we want to highlight before I open it up to some questions are obviously the, the good work that uh, Representative Kolkmeyer has done on litigation reform this week. Uh, so we'll start with him. Well, we had uh, three bills this week uh, that we brought forward. Uh, one was the kind of the meat and the potatoes that, and dealt with the statutes dealing with venue. Um, St. Louis has become the nation's courtroom and we filed the bill and put some things in the statute to uh, pull back on that just a little bit. Currently there are 8,400 out-of-state plaintiffs with cases filed in St. Louis and uh, that's over overcrowding our uh, dockets. Uh, we have judges coming from all over the state to fill in to uh, the uh, St. Louis courts and uh, it's time that we pull back a little bit. So that's mainly what those, the, the one was about. The other two uh, dealt with uh, uh, court uh, rules and uh, kind of they, those two bills, those three bills kind of tied hand in hand. So one was the statutes and then one dealt with uh, uh, the rules of the court. What about the concern that this could have unintended consequences and make it more difficult to bring uh, cases under the Merchandising Practicing Act and also join together to fight um, claims in different counties? That was not our intent whatsoever. It was to disenfranchise any Missouri citizen uh, as far as when and where they could bring their, their cases. Uh, we were mainly trying to work on the, the out-of-state, uh, the plaintiffs. And I think, let me add to that a little bit. I think it's important to remember um, not a single thing uh, we did today forecloses any cause of any person's ability to bring a cause of action uh, in this state. And there's still going to be a lot of opportunity for plaintiffs uh, to join together in common suits. Um, but trying to create the right balance in our system where cases are properly venued uh, in the place that they should be was, was, was our goal. And I think Representative Kolkmeyer's uh, bill gets us to that point. Anything else on that? Actually, let me ask one question on uh, the Senate passed um, a, a bill that would create the crime of illegal. I thought re you were going to stop right there and say the Senate passed a bill. I thought that <laughs> <was> <laughs> <a little bit. laughs> Miracle, not Uber. Uh, no, this has to do with illegal reentry um, into the U.S. If uh, someone illegally enters, then commits a crime here, um, is, it's on its way to the House now. Any uh, chance? Of, what type of reception do you expect that to get? Uh, we'll, here? we'll take a hard look at it. I haven't seen it. Uh, didn't hear any of the debate over there. Haven't had a chance to to even see who the House sponsor is going to be on it. But I'll be glad to take a look at it and get back with you. Is that something though that you think would probably? Yeah. Be look, we're going to. Yeah. We. Uh, if you guys have attended some joint press conference between the House and the Senate, we have continued to enjoy a good working relationship uh, with the other side of the building. So the things they send us, we intend to take seriously and take a hard look at. So. Um, We'll, we'll go to work on it. The, uh, the, the second issue uh, I want to talk a little bit about today, obviously dominated a lot of the debate uh, yesterday, uh, was the efforts of uh, Representative Chipman uh, to uh, really to bring some certainty to, to what our uh, minimum wage standards are going to be in Missouri and make sure that Missouri employers have the right uh, to hire people at the state minimum wage. With that, I'll turn it over to Jason. Thank you all for being here. Um, like the speaker said, this is going to bring some certainty to businesses when they're budgeting and trying to plan for what's ahead of them. Uh, it won't imprison them or fine them for following state law. And it, it will provide them with an environment where they're able to provide new job seekers who need that first step in the economic ladder a chance to achieve that without overburdening them with expensive regulations. So part of the ordinance that St. Louis City passed included the potential for 90 days in jail or a $5,000 fine if you were found in violation of their ordinance. Oh, and sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You were answering her question. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Uh, well, my but completely different question. Okay. okay. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the speed, the process that this, that this went through. I mean, last week was the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, and it went through the chamber probably as fast as any bill I've seen. It was only my second session, but um, 
can both of you speak to that? Yeah, I guess? Look, I mean, obviously part of part of what we try to do here is have a certain landscape for for employers and citizens to operate in. And when the Supreme Court uh, made made their decision, there was a whole lot of uncertainty injected uh, in the process. We're now past the midway point in session, um, and so we felt like it was a priority to get this uh, bill moving as fast as possible to bring some certainty back to that landscape. And so that's what we did. Well, we've moved other bills with, with similar speed. Could you respond to what Representative Carpenter had to say about the, the grandfather clause? When that came up two years ago, what do you remember the debate about that clause having been? Well, my recollection of that was it was, a, it was added over in the Senate, and it was really an effort to try to uh, accommodate a, a city of St. Louis ordinance on public uh, works projects. Um, the, the intent was always um, of the legislature, and, and at the time was always to make sure that uh, we had a consistent wage rate uh, across across the state, and that people had the right to employ people and to hire them at that minimum wage rate. That's my recollection of it. I want to ask too. I know that you stepped out of the chamber to speak with uh, Mike Moon. At least it looks like whenever he went out of the chamber, was there anything that you said to him to you know make sure that he was a yes vote on this because it was kind of straddling the line on that emergency clause. I walked out of the back of the chamber and. Uh, didn't, didn't speak to Representative Moon specifically, but I did list, listen in. And I mean, look, we have conversations all the time with members about um, the substance of the argument. And there were some things I think that did not come out in the debate that members wanted to share with them and their view of, of uh, why this was in fact an emergency, but that kind of stuff happens all the time. Anything else? Chipman, uh, Representative Chipman, I know that you were uh, part of that uh, corral that was around uh, Representative Moon's death. Can you speak to maybe some of the argument that was going on? During that Actually, I, I just kind of stopped and started to listen. And when I realized that how many people were there to talk to him, I realized that I was just going to try have to speak over everybody else. So uh, keep, I keep, keep in mind, I understand the, that that Representative Moon was the last vote. There were 108 other people that voted on this. So I think the uh, the focus on Representative Moon here may be a little bit overblown. Speaker, do you support raising the minimum wage statewide, maybe not to $15 an hour, but um, $10, $11? Well, we, we, had, we had that conversation yesterday. We had amendments on the floor offered to those effects, that effect yesterday. Um, I voted, uh, like my colleagues did, uh, against, against those bills. What I support is wage growth in the state of Missouri, and I think it is a little bit disingenuous for the other side of the aisle um, to act like this is the only way to generate wage growth. We are seeing our neighboring states have a lot more wage growth than we have here in the state of Missouri. And I've said this repeatedly. Missouri's wage growth has been stagnant for a long time. In fact, the bargaining power of a family of four, now $5,000 less than it was a decade ago because our wage growth here in Missouri isn't keeping up with inflation. That has nothing to do with what our state minimum wage rate is. That has to do with the fact that we don't have an economy that's growing as fast as our neighbors. And so I think we ought to keep the focus on creating the kind of strong, vibrant, dynamic economy here in Missouri that allows for upward mobility and wage growth and people to uh, build a better life for themselves. And that's what we're going to spend our time focused on this session. What indicators are you looking at when you say our economy is growing as wage fast? Growth. Well, there's, there's lots of them, but wage growth, I think, is the most important one because that's the one that families feel every day in their pocket. Uh, it's one thing for our unemployment rate to be a little better, but if people aren't earning more and they aren't raising their, their buying and spending power, uh, then they're not feeling like this recovery has done anything for them. Uh, so we need to create the kind of environment here where we are seeing wage growth, where families have the opportunity to work hard um, and to keep more of what they earn and, and build a better life for themselves, and that's what our caucus has been all about. Anything else on minimum wage? Last big effort that I'm sure you guys are itching to talk about, you're probably not, but you should be, was Representative uh, Ross's uh, work uh, this week on regulatory reform, and I'll let him fire away. So uh, the bill that we picked up and, and passed this past week uh, was the commonly known as the Sunrise Act. And, you know, on one of the, the big big priorities for the, for the governor, for the speaker, myself, in you know hearing from different constituents and and looking at our our economy is the role that government plays in you know relative to occupational licensing and apparently i mean there's a you know there's a very fine line that we as a state have to walk to ensure the safety of the public for some of the different things that, that we require licensure for however there are numerous examples of different things that that we as a state get involved with that frankly don't really have a public safety component to that so 
The Sunrise Act, and, and a lot of this effort, you know, the groundwork was laid by Representative Eric Burleson uh, from Greene County. He worked on this a number of different years. Uh, so this wasn't my idea, but it's something that I believe in and think, you know, I want to see it through. Uh, this sets up a structure, a framework, so that when bills are filed in the future uh, or as new occupations are decided by the state to be regulated, there's a, there's a framework that, you know, if we have that interest, that government should take the least restrictive action necessary to, to provide that pub public protection uh, without being overly burdensome. And uh, anyway, it's a, uh, it, it's a good thing that uh, I'm proud to support and I appreciate the rest of the body's support uh, that will ultimately uh, help our economy and, and move the government out of the way. Anything else on that? I predicted correctly, you all had questions <laughs> prepared for some well, sir, uh, I know that this is something that's, uh, that House leadership has been a big part of. Uh, I thought Representative It's been Carr something the House though. Republican Caucus has been supportive yeah. of for a long time, not just House leadership. Okay. Uh, didn't Representative Parr have a similar bill too? There were actually four bills, so, okay. uh, and I'm going to try to, to work my way through. So there was House Bill 480, uh, which was my bill. There was uh, 272 and 413, which were Representative Chrissy Summer and Representative Bill White's and then Representative Haar had House Bill 609. And so the three of those bills were identical and that's why they were combined as they came through my uh, professional registration and licensing committee. And then there were some differences that were contained within Representative Haar's bill. Those were incorporated within those, although they were very, they were largely similar and all along the same lines. I mean, this is something that we, we share a common goal in working towards, uh, towards this effort. Uh, has there been any past versions of this bill that have made it to the governor's desk to veto or has it just never made it out? Not to my knowledge. I know that. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I think uh, it's made it to the Senate on several occasions, and I think that may have been the uh, the hang up in previous sessions. So, as the chair of professional registration and licensing, one of the problems that I've heard from Republicans uh, in the House and the Senate is that there are a lot of current laws on the books that. Uh, stop people from getting licensed or have too high burdens of getting licensed is the next step then repealing some of those already existing laws well and that's what we're taking a look at I mean the speaker was very clear in his uh, you know opening day speech and talking about what these regulations how they affect our economy how they affect our constituents and you know once again I mean we've it's not an easy task to find that appropriate balance of protecting the public yet staying out of the way when government has really no interest to be there and so the, the Sunrise Act is a component of that. There will be other legislation that is moving through the Professional Registration and Licensing Committee. And uh, frankly, there will probably be some bills that, that we identify uh, issues and then, you know, file later on in session. Other questions? Anything else? All right, fire away. Yeah. Um, excuse me. Uh, this is the second week that Real ID hasn't come up for a vote. Are we going to see it on the floor before Congress? I don't know. That'll ultimately be a decision the, the floor leader will make. I know uh, that uh, he's intent on having some conversations with the Senate sponsor and uh, with the Senate leadership on what their intent on the, the Senate bill is. Uh, but we remain committed to finding a solution to that issue. Do you have enough votes in the House to pass it? I believe we have enough votes to pass it. So it's not dead? No. Um, the Senate's debating over right now. One of um, their proposal, uh, their Senate sub is trying to make some parity between taxis and the uh, transportation companies. Yeah. Do, do you support um, changes like that to the legislation? I, I haven't seen the details of substitute, so I won't comment on whether I support or don't support that particular provision. But what we've always tried to do in this space is to create uh, a level playing field where companies like Uber and Lyft can, can operate in Missouri. So um, our focus has always been to create a fair a, f a fair framework, and to the extent that it does that, uh, then we'll support the bill. Anything so else? What is uh, coming up next week? Uh, well, I haven't even had time to digest what we did this week. Um, look, we're going to start uh, work next week on, uh, I know, on some of the education reform uh, pieces. It's something we've uh, been, been looking at and working on for some time. Um, but you'd have to ask the floor leader beyond that what exactly he, he plans to bring up. Anything else? Are there any concerns that that's going to run into some problems with that bill? 
I hope not. Uh, I remain confident that uh, we're still here at the beginning of March, and I remain confident that uh, when we get to the end of May, we're going to have delivered to the people of Missouri on the substantive priorities that uh, the Senate and the House have talked about and, and that are shared by the governor. So I'm still very optimistic about where we end up. Senator Romine's bill. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Robert Ross is better with numbers than I am. So. <laughs> but uh, it was read on Monday. Do you plan on referring it to committee? It, it'll, it'll be referred to committee. Uh, it's a, we've had, we have a similar uh, measure uh, that's already had a hearing, obviously, as many of you know, uh, in the House committee. Um, so it'll go to the same committee, special litigation reform uh, for hearing.